Dear Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy name. We thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity of this day. We thank you for the blessings in our lives. Father, our cups do runneth over, and you are quick to chastise, you are quick to judge, and you are quick to praise. You are always there for us, Father, and we thank you for always dealing with us in, in, in a perfect order. And we owe it all to you, and we give you praise and thanks this day. We also have these prayers before you, Father, that are unspoken. You know every heart, every need, every wish, every dream, every concern. And we thank you for not only hearing these prayers, but we thank you for answering them in perfect season. We also pray, dear Lord, for, for young Taylor, who's laying up in a hospital bed right now. Dear Lord, that uh, first and foremost, we pray that she answers your call, the call to Jesus, that we know that you have called her and you will continue to call her until she answers, Father. And we pray that she will answer this day. And we pray for her health and safety to get out of the hospital. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. And we pray for Ross and Becca and all the family that are experiencing a terrible or ordeal that, that Taylor is going through and has been going through. We pray for all of them, Father, for strength in the hour of need. And as always, Father, we pray for all those who have come and gone from our chapel that you watch over them. We pray, dear Lord, that they're still in thy word that they have not forsaken thy word, and if they have, that they will return to thy word this day, Father. And I pray that they will return to the sheepfold soon. And as always, Father, we pray for Israel, and we pray for our nation, for thy kingdom to come, that it will be thy will that will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. And as always, Father, we pray for those first responders every day they are on the front lines helping your children. We pray for their safety. And we pray for our military who are in arm's way or who are about to go into arm's way for their safety and speedy return home. And Father, we pray for the lost, those that do not have an opportunity this day to receive thy truth, knowing that someday, Father, that you will call and they will have an opportunity to answer thy call. And we pray that they will not hesitate. Now, Father, I pray that you open up our eyes that we may see. I pray that you open up our ears that we may hear thy words as it is written, as it will be you that speaks to us this day. In Yeshua's precious holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Getting back into our Father's Word. We left off in Matthew chapter 22 last week. We had just been finished about um, finished with uh, Christ speaking, um, telling us, "For many are called, but few are chosen." So today he's going to be dealing with the uh, Pharisee, the Sadducee, the the uh, disciples of the temple, and the, and his own disciples. So with that being said. Please open your Bibles with me, Matthew chapter 22. We're going to pick it up with verse 15 with wisdom from our Heavenly Father. And it reads, Then went the Pharisee and took counsel how they might entangle him, him being Jesus, in his talk. In other words, they <coughs> wanted to use, basically, how would Christ talk? Well, he would talk as far as uh, teaching scripture. He was a teacher. And uh, so what they wanted to do, what their thought was, was to entangle them in God's own word. And Christ, of course, being the word of God. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. And Christ being the word even though he was flesh man at this point, and he would teach the people the gospel, the word of God. So they thought, well, we're going to entangle him with his own words. So verse 16. And they, that's the Pharisees, and they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, now the Herodians... Uh, basically were, means the house of the Herods, 
Uh, they're from Rome. So they were the high muckety ducks that Rome sent out to basically control the Pharisee and the Sadducee, control those in the temple. So, and uh, also let's not overlook that the Pharisees sent their own disciples, their own students, to, uh, to Jesus. And what do they call him? What, what does it start? It says, Master. Master basically means teacher. So they're calling him teacher. Notice they didn't call him Lord. Master, we know that thou art true. Now, now think, think about that just for a moment. Their, their initial statement, we know that you're true. That's basically saying we know that what's coming out of your mouth is accurate. And that's telling them, that, that shows Jesus right off the bat, they're a bunch of liars. And Jesus knows why, why they're there. You know, they're there to entangle him, try to trip him up in his words. Master, we know that thou art true and teachest the way of God in truth. Now, you would think with them really believing this, I mean, if, if, if you believe this, which you do, would you question Christ? You know, would, would, you, would you try to trick him up? No. And teach us the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man. That means they, Christ doesn't put one person over another. For thou regardest not the person of men. Now what are they actually doing here with, with Jesus or trying to do? Flatter him up, basically. Yeah, flatter him. You know, flatter. Just remember how it was back then when people would, let's say, go to the king's courts or princess's courts, they would, usually the first thing they would say, king, and they'd name their name, live forever. And you are the leader of this, and you are the raiser of that. and You are mighty. You are mighty, you know, and all this. So that's, that's basically what they're trying to do with Jesus here. But it's not going to work. But this is also something I think that we need to understand at times dealing with people in general is that uh, a lot of times people think that they're trying to, um, I don't know, encourage you. or I, I really don't know what they're thinking sometimes, but... They're, they keep patting you on the back and saying how good you are and how good the lecture was and how good the sermon was and how how good you do this and how good you do that. And I think, um, luckily, I don't have that kind of uh, praises anymore because of how many times I was given that kind of praise and I would always say, to God be the glory. Mm -hmm. That's where that came from. Mm -hmm. No, that's why I always say at the end of our lectures, to God be the glory, because it's all Him. You know, my prayer before we ever have our lectures or or, or gatherings is that uh, that it not be my mouth, but His mouth. Not my will, His will. Not my speech, but His speech, you know. Uh, because without Him, without His Holy Spirit, we learn nothing. We absolutely learn nothing. We're just blowing smoke. You know, and there's a lot of people that that happens to today. And they go to some of these places and they're entertained. And there's a lot of good people out there. What I mean by good people, there's a lot of people out there that know how to entertain. Okay. Good, good motivational speakers. Motivational speak. And there's nothing wrong with being a motivational speaker. But if it's your own words, what are you teaching? Yeah. Your own thoughts. Your own... Now, we all have testimonies that we can give, which should be powerful if they're true testimonies, should be powerful and move people in their lives. But the thing is, we don't take credit for it, you know. And, um, and button up all the way here. And um, so we, we need to give credit where credit is due. Well, these people are trying to flatter Jesus coming out the gate. So... They say in verse 17, um, Tell us, therefore, 
what thinkest thou? What do you think? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? Now, what are they really asking Jesus here? Well, let's put it this way. At the time, was it the law to pay tribute, meaning to pay a tax? Yes. Was it the law to pay a tax? Yes. Is it the law today to pay a tax? Yes. So what are they really saying here? Let me put it to you in a different word. Is it against the law to obey the law? <laughs> or, they say, or are they asking, is it against God's law to obey the law? No, wait a minute now. No, they just says, is it lawful? Now, granted, they were Herodians and the disciples of the temple. So, that's a good question, because if these were from the temple, they're supposed to be obeying God's law. So, in God's law, was, it, was there a law to pay tribute to Caesar? Or was there a law against it? You weren't supposed to serve idols. I don't know if that would be considered idol worship to do something like that. Oh, what about uh, in uh, in the Bible uh, where it gives an account of um, um, obey the law of the land? Yeah. Because was that... The, see, they were under Roman rule at this point. Mm -hmm. Technically, God was always in charge, especially for the Jew. But the Roman Empire had come in, uh, many be, even before the Roman Empire, and took things over because they were disobedient children to God. Let's mm -hmm. face it. Still are to this day in, in a lot of cases. Not all. Well, it's a good question because I want to open this up to discussion because we've got to bring this to today. Well, let me, let me do the next question. Well, wasn't first. it obey the law of the land as long as it doesn't go against God's law? Yes. Of course. So the question is asked, is it law lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? And I'll read a couple more verses and then we'll expound on it. 18. <clears throat> but Jesus perceived, or he, he saw their wickedness and said, Why tempt or why test ye me, ye hypocrites? Call them what they were. Well, what is a hypocrite? A person who says one thing and does another. You know, they're, remember, they're from the temple, supposed to be under God's law, but they're not obeying God's law, see. So Jesus says in verse 19, show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. And a penny back then was worth about 44 cents. It's not just like a little, well, it's a little, it's a little, what looks to be about the size of a penny for us today, but at that point it was worth about 44 cents. 20, and he saith unto them, Whose is this image and superscription, inscription on it? 21, they say unto him, Caesar's. Then saith he, being Jesus unto them, Render or pay, Therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. So, with that understanding, with that statement, number one, let's bring it to today. People pay taxes today, some people pay taxes, some people don't pay taxes. Some people don't pay taxes where they should be paying taxes, and some don't have to pay taxes because it's lawful for them not to pay taxes because of their income level and status. So it's still lawful today to pay taxes. And if, and if you're supposed to pay taxes and you don't pay taxes, um, you're going to find yourself into trouble if you don't handle it correctly. So we can understand that. And, and I don't think anything along that vein has changed at all other than paying more taxes than, than even 
Well, I can't even say that because people were dirt poor back then and still had to pay tax. You know, so it, it may have even been rougher on them than it is for us today, believe it or not. I think if they didn't pay their taxes, they took their land or something. There's all kinds of things that they could have yeah. done. Yeah. But what's interesting, it says, pay here unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's. Well, what was Caesar's back then? Well, Caesar... Basically, Caesar and the Roman Empire were the governing body. Uh, I should say fleshly government uh, in, in Jerusalem at this time and, and quite a, a lot of other regions. So the Roman government established through Caesar or by Caesar certain taxes. And it was law <coughs> for them to pay taxes. Now Christ isn't saying don't pay your taxes. He's not saying don't follow that Roman rule. No, it's it's not fair what they were doing, but it was the law of the land, you know. So Christ is saying, look, you you give to Caesar what is Caesar's, you know. But notice it says here, and unto God, the things that are God. Well, what are we to give to God? Because this is talking about when it, the word render means pay so let's 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 divide that up pay therefore unto caesar the things which are caesar's we could also say pay unto god the things that are god's well what what are, what are we supposed to pay does god need money does mm -hmm. god need land well what 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 is he talking about wouldn't here? that be like our works and our Praise. Praise and our soul, basically, giving yourself to do God's work in one aspect. Remember a couple of weeks ago, we are talking about, uh, we are studying about um, reasonable service, mm -hmm. which is basically the same thing. You know, it's, it's reasonable service to do certain things for God. Well, how do we do things for God today? What What is it? You say acts. Well, what do you mean by acts? To who? To what? To where? Well, it can be anything. It can be a mother raising her children in God's way. It can be mm -hmm. helping someone less fortunate, helping mm -hmm. someone who's down on their luck, somebody who mm -hmm. you take a meal to. It it's basically be. whatever you do in life, you give to God. You, you do it for God in His in His name and in His glory and in His honor. So that's paying God. Mm -hmm. Basically, you can't pay for your salvation mm -hmm. because you've already been bought through Jesus' blood. It was a free gift. So yeah. You can't pay for that salvation. It is a free gift. You know, a gift that he gave his life for. Mm -hmm. So let's not overlook that big part of it. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, like what you're saying, and put it in a different terminology, basically you're doing good works for other people. Yeah. And you, by doing good works for the other people, you're doing unto God. And God, in turn, you're reaping the rewards, usually. Because there's some people, well, what I mean by usually, you're still reaping the rewards because you're, you're, you're going to be given the keys to the kingdom. But when I, what I meant by usually is that in flesh life, even though peop, some people do good works, they're still being persecuted shamefully. Mm -hmm. And to say, well, they're doing a good work, so they're being blessed. Well, they are being blessed, but guess what? Sometimes those blessings aren't even uh, profoundly given until after Father calls them home because of the life that they have to go through just to do. Can you imagine? It, it's easy for us to sit here and in Asheville, North Carolina, and and uh, and uh, praise the Lord and honor Him, and and all whomsoever can come in and, and and reap the rewards of study. But can you imagine? There's places in on this planet right now that you can't do this. I mean, we would not be standing here with the with the uh, windows and the doors open and all. Everything would be closed up and and hidden, you know, and. You'd have to be careful how many people came in and how many people left at one time. In other words, everything had to be secret. 
<laughs> and then even uh, some people that are found out and, and persecuted, some are killed. They still continue to honor the Lord, but they do it in secret. They keep moving around, and that's it. We don't have we don't have to do that, you know. But we need to realize that, especially when when we, and I hate to say it, sometimes kind of get high and mighty in our thinking. Realize that. We're still in a world that, that hates Christians. And it's getting even worse now. There's more and more people and and groups of people that are hating Christians. And they're doing whatever they can to eliminate it. Well, that's been since day one. And, and Well, and here's, here's the difference, though, today is these days even some Christians are persecuting Christians because they don't believe in the same thing. Well, true. That's called denominationalism. Mm -hmm. Because basically denomination, if you take it back to its prime understanding, means division. And our Father never created division. Mm -hmm. The only division, well, He didn't create it. It created itself through Satan. The division was between God's seed and Satan's seed. Mm -hmm. And um, But that's a person's own doing. God, God didn't. Our Father didn't create that. You know, evil created that. But it's important to understand about this pay unto, unto God the things that are God's. Because technically he owns it all. But um, to pay to him, I, I would say, how do we pay him? Well, obey the commandments. And not just obey them, but do them. <coughs> do them. You know. So, when these high monkeys are not high muckety ducks in verse 22 when they had heard these words they marveled and left him and went their way they couldn't say anything why because they tried to trip him up you know they got their big heads together and said well we're, we're going to trip him up doing this now think about when christ first started his ministry what's the first thing the very first thing that happened to him he was taken. He was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness, and who did he confront? Who confronted him? I should say, Satan. Satan. But what did Satan do? Did Satan just start spewing forth words? No, he twisted the word of God. So he used Scripture, yeah, to try to trick Christ. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't a hundred percent accurate Scripture. There was a little tweak at the end that if, yes, 95% of the thing that he quoted was absolutely perfectly true, but it was that little 5% at the end that he twisted to try to trip Christ up. Mm -hmm. Of course, Christ being the Word couldn't be tripped up. Well, guess what? That's the kind of position. That's why we need to study to show ourselves approved. Because we need to get to the point where we have these scripture lawyers of the world. Forget about Satan just for a moment. I'm just talking about even, as you said, Christians persecuting Christians. Well, how do they persecute them? If they're Christian, they see, the thing is... How do use the word of God? Yes. Mm -hmm. But they do it the same way. Now, how do, not mm -hmm. always. Not Take always. Take it out of context. Take it out of yeah. context. Mm -hmm. You know, and which all does kind of twist it because you're not following what it actually meant. Exactly, yeah. exactly. That's where we get the flyaway doctrine from. That's where we get Ishtar from. You know, that's where we get Christmas from. Mm -hmm. You know, and they 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 manipulate the Word of God to fit their own agenda. We need to be. I'm not saying a Bible scholar. But we need to be versed enough to know the basics to where we'll, we can even realize, okay, you're quoting this verse. <coughs> Let's look that up if you don't know it and understand the subject, object, and article from where that verse came from. Well, let's go look that up. Ninety percent of the time they won't want to do that. Especially when you take them to like the flyaway doctrine, you take them to First Thessalonians and you tell them what air actually means. Mm -hmm. You know, they think it's being flown up into the air. And it means, according to the Greek excuse me, Greek manuscript, breath of life. But see, they don't want to go that deep. 
because they're they're giving you what they've been given, mm -hmm. and they haven't checked it out for themselves. And this is how we <coughs> pay God. We check it out for ourselves. It's not that we question Him, but we want to know Him. We want to know the fullness that He gives us. Well, we so, question we question man. We don't question God. We're questioning what man's giving we, us. Yes, we question man, but we also we can question ourselves and our understanding yeah. of the verse. We don't question the, the verse. No. But, but we, we don't take it at face value of what you read it as, because when you take it back, it means a deeper, you get a deeper. At times, at times, not always. Sometimes yeah. it's, it's very, it's very simple. But you don't know unless you check it out. Exactly, exactly. So they left him, they went their way. Verse 23, the same day came to him, the same day came to him the Sadducees. Now hear this would say that there is no resurrection. That's something you gotta you gotta remember before we finish this this study here. The Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection. Now what what do we mean by resurrection? Are we talking about Jesus rising? No, they thought when you're dead you're dead. Yeah. You don't go to the Father. Right. And they also this resurrection means Christ is not going to come back. Okay, listen. The same day came to him the Sadducee, which say that there is no resurrection, and asked him, saying, verse 24, Master, again, he, teacher, Moses said, if a man die, having no children, his brother shall marry his wife, and raise up seed unto his brother. Now, is this a true statement? Moses actually say this? Mm -hmm. Yes, he did. Yeah. 25. Now, there were with us seven brethren, seven men, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, <coughs> he died. And having no issue or having no child, left his wife unto his brother. Now, was that legal? Yes. No. Just like when Jesus was on the cross, uh, giving uh, John to 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 Mary, say, different subject for a different time. Likewise, twenty six. The second also. In other words, the second man. Same thing happened to him. And the third, all the way under the seventh. All seven men. You know, this this woman married, and and the men died, and she had no children, but she kept being passed from. From brother to brother. Okay. Seven times. Twenty-seven. And last of all, the woman died also. After all this happened, the woman finally died. Twenty-eight. Therefore, in the resurrection. Now, in the resurrection. They don't believe in the resurrection. Okay. So Jesus knows coming out the gate, these Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection. But they're asking a resurrection question. It's like today. It's like today someone comes up to you. And throughout, throughout your conversation, however short or long it is, you realize that A, they may not be following the Word of God. B, they may not even believe in our Father. They may not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yet they're asking you questions about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what is that telling you? That tells you nine times out of ten, if a person's already made up their own mind about the Lord, they're just trying to cause problems. They're just trying to, to cause friction. They're trying to, to maybe <coughs> even steer you away from the Lord. A lot of people say, well, that's one way I can, I can discuss the Lord with them. How can you discuss the Lord with someone who doesn't believe in the Lord? You say, well, it's an opportunity. It opens a door. It may. That's why we need to be governed by the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit has also told us, do not cast our pearls before swine. And I'm not calling everybody a pig that doesn't believe in the Lord. But the fact of the matter is, is there's a lot of people out there that want to trip you up. Well, you can usually tell when you're talking to somebody whether they're genu genuinely interested and want to learn more or if they're just throwing things at you to try to basically 
start an argument. Yeah, start an argument or just get you stirred up or. Yeah, you know. and it's not just non Christians. No. As 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 you said just a few moments ago, it's even Christian against Christian. Mm -hmm. I mean, why do we have so many different churches? Yeah. That everybody agrees? No, they don't agree. That's why there's so many different churches. But there's only one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, and one God and Father of all. So why do we have all these other? Because you got so many people ticked off that don't want to do it a certain way. Mm -hmm. So they left. Okay. Instead of discussing it, dealing with it, working it out, they left. First, like Jesus said, he didn't come to bring peace. He came to bring division. Yes. So, they ask about, but all, all these men, they died... And finally the woman died. Then, then they ask in, in verse 28, Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. They were all married to her. So who she's going to be married to? Okay. Now coming out the gate, are these guys hypocrites? Do you think? If they say they don't believe in the resurrection and they're asking a resurrection question. Exactly. Exactly. But Jesus is kind, and he's gentle, and he is a master, meaning a teacher. So he says, Jesus answered in 29, and said unto them, Ye do err. In other, in other words, you make a mistake. Not knowing or not recognizing the scriptures. Now remember, these are Sadducees. They're supposed to know the scriptures. But Jesus knows they don't know the scriptures. Why? Because they don't believe in the resurrection. How can you say you, you know and understand the Word of God and you don't believe in the resurrection? Nor the power of God. They don't believe or understand the power of God. What does that mean, that they didn't understand the power of God? That He can resurrect. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would say that's one of the biggest, biggest uh, dunamis, meaning power, one of the big ones that our Father has to to raise raise the dead and return. Basically, no one's has anyone ever really died. No, not even Satan. But listen, thirty for in the resurrection. Now that's Christ's documentation here. Not maybe it'll happen, but in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. As the angels of God in heaven. Now I want to go to a little bit deeper study on this. You can hold your place here. I want to go to 1 John. Not the book of John, but 1 John, chapter 3. It's right after 2 Peter. Well, actually it's after... Yeah, Second Peter, and then you got First John. First John, chapter three. It says this: Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Remember that person at flea market years ago said that we're all sons of God, and at that point we didn't understand. We thought he was. Yeah, yeah. Remember that? Um, basically, what are sons of God? Well, they're, they're angelic beings. They're messengers, you know, in that, in that form. Therefore, the world knoweth or recognizes us not because it knew him not. It didn't recognize him. And this is why we came here, verse 2. Beloved... Now are we the sons of God. What? Now? I thought you had to be dead. Now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. In other words, coming to Christ, accepting the Lord Jesus Christ, makes you an heir of Christ. Which, and, and sons of God is really genderless. It doesn't mean females can't get in the club. We could just say mankind, if you will. But it says that, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. 
In other words, we don't fully understand how and what we're going to become. We don't, we, we don't know how we're going to, to, to be that an angelic being. We know that it's going to happen, but we don't know how we're going to feel. We have insight of how we're going to feel, but we've never been there other than the first earth, first heaven age. Different subject for a different time. Let me start verse 2 over again. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, see this document that we're talking about, the resurrection. When he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And that's the elect. At that point... When Christ, and we've studied this in other places in the Bible, when Christ returns, he has, he calls who first? The last shall be first and the first shall be last? Mm -hmm. Well, the fact is, who, who, who's going to be reigning with Christ at that point? Right in the very beginning of the millennial period. Those who already have died. No. All that have died are not reigning with Christ at that point. Mm -hmm. All that have, you're talking about no longer in flesh mm -hmm. bodies. Because remember, you still have a great gulf fixed. Right. right. So the only ones that will reign with Christ in the very beginning are God's elect. Those that have believed in him, have trusted in him, and have followed his ways. And have repented and did those things that are right. They are, are called God's elect, and they're the ones that have overcome in this lifetime. Okay, But when Christ returns, you're still going to have some people, a lot of people, that just don't follow Christ. Or that knew of Christ, knew of him, but didn't obey him, didn't follow him. That's not the elect. Only the elect that have followed him and done the things that he's told us to do in his word. And we have shown that because we've done it in this lifetime. Those are God's elect. And they're chosen. God cho chooses his elect. But he doesn't choose them by chance and, and different subject for a different time. But I believe that it was in the first earth, first heaven age that they stood with Christ. They stood with their father when Satan was rebelling. You know, as it's written in Genesis chapter 6. Um, but that, again, is a different subject for a different time. Uh, and, and then um, we'll be like him when this takes place. And one more verse, verse 3. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Because he's an elect. See? So this is what we're talking about, really. In, in back in Matthew uh, uh, chapter 22 verse 30, for in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. At that point, all people are changed, but you still have a division of people. You got the elect, and you've got those that are not the elect. <coughs> but every knee will bow at that point. We know that. We've studied it. So. Christ continues in verse verse uh, 31. But as touching or concerning the resurrection of the dead, have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God? So, here's another thing. Did Jesus said, haven't you read chapter, book so-and-so, chapter so-and-so, verse so-and-so? Why Why didn't he it, pin it, it down? It wasn't broken down like that back then. What was it? Scrolls. It was all scrolls. It was yes, it was all scrolls. But but the thing is, how was the Bible written back then? Well, number one, we know it was the Old Testament, of course. It was mm -hmm. the Torah. But it was just a book. Mm -hmm. And there was no division of wording. Mm -hmm. It wasn't broken up into chapters, and it wasn't broken up into verses. It was the Word of God, and it was a continuous Word of God until the end of the book. Mm -hmm. But here, Jesus is saying, haven't you read? Now, who is he talking to here? He's talking to those Sadducees. Again, they're supposed to be part of the high muckety-duck order of the temple. 
And he's saying, haven't you read it? Haven't you read what God has said? Saying, verse 32, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Here's Christ proclaiming. Yes, you've had, you've had bodies die, and you, you've placed them in tombs and stuff. But they're not dead. Now, now, how many people knew and understood this? Well, the only ones that knew and understood this was God's remnant, God's elect. You know, those that believed and trusted in the word. But you've got to understand, here, he's talking to the ones coming out of the temple, and they don't believe in the resurrection. They don't believe in life eternal. You know, they may say that they believe God, but how could they believe God if God has said in his word about he's the God of the living? But they're supposed to be the ones that receive the word and teach it to others. And coming out the great that's why coming out the gate, that's why he's calling them hypocrites. Because they're saying one thing and doing another. Now that's why Christ said in another place in, in, in his word, you know, believe them what they believe what they say, but don't do what they do. And what he meant by what they say is, in other words, when they're speaking the word, believe that word, but don't do what they're doing because they're a bunch of hypocrites. Is it any different today? In most cases, no. There's a lot of people say that they're Christian. Say that that the, their denomination this or denomination that and brother this and sister that, but the thing is, they're not living the word like they're supposed to. And I'm not talking about being perfect. I'm talking about even when you make mistakes, you repent. And then repent. True repentance means you you truly and honestly in your heart try not to do that sin again. That's true repentance. You have a change of mind, change of attitude. You know, change of heart. And there's a lot of people today that just don't have that. And they're a bunch of hypocrites. You know, I'm not calling them that. Our Father is. Because if they're, if they're doing one thing and saying one thing and doing another, they're hypocrites. And that could even be us at times if we're, if we're behaving in such, such manner. So what happened? 33. And when the multitude heard this, heard these things that, that Christ said, they were astonished at his doctrine. Well, it's the word of God. Why are they astonished at the word of God? Well, chances are they may have never even heard yeah, the word of God. Not, or they just heard little bits and pieces. They've not, because if the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection, they wouldn't have been telling no telling what they were teaching. Yeah, they weren't telling people about it. <laughs> they were kind of leaving parts out. Well, just like today. Mm -hmm. No, just like today. Um, Don't want to offend. Now, granted, we can't sit down. Well, I guess we could, but it'd be very difficult, time time frame wise. Sit down and start at the beginning of the book and read the entire book in a day sitting. Oh no, not a day. Yeah. You know, I'll talk about it in, in a in a, uh, in a uh, lecture <coughs> forum. Well, we've been working on Matthew for over a year. Well, my point <laughs> being is, just because you can't do it continuously in one day doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it. Yeah. And I'll be perfectly honest with you. This is why when you do this kind of format, there's very few people. Because they don't want to take the time to do it that way. Mm -hmm. You say, well, why? Because they want to be entertained. You know, and 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 I used to believe this. I used to believe that you needed to to. I wasn't using the word entertain at the time. Do what you need to do to bring the people in. Do what you need mm -hmm. to do, and and once you get them there, to hold them there. Give them what they want. You give them what they want. But yeah. isn't that how so many things got twisted, like Easter? Pretty much. 
yeah. that they took the word of God. They're like, oh, well, we're going to try to bring people in, so we're going to incorporate bunnies yes. and eggs. Because and then they'll we're going to, to do an uh, Easter egg roll on the front lawn so we well, can get let, let, people let's, in. Let's, let's look at this just for a moment since you bring it up. We'll call it the Church of Nicaea. Mm -hmm. They wanted to, well, not necessarily the Church of Nicaea, but, but the earliest or early churches, not the, not the Christian when, when the disciples were yeah. still forming. But I'm talking about later on. It's basically when Rome got involved in it, wasn't it? The king? Well, no, because even Paul, after he established churches, were having problems mm. with some of the churches. That's why, that's where we get the books from. Right. You know, where he's, he's basically chastising the behavior of some people in the earliest church mm -hmm. or churches. But let's let's take the the forming of the, the, the Christian denomination church in the in the beginning. When you're talking about establishing Easter Easter because they wanted more people to come into the church. That's correct and it's also incorrect because yes they wanted more people of course to come into the church but what they were really doing especially at the church of Nicaea and I think what was it 438 AD I, I can't remember the exact uh, century or, or uh, date but it was around that time they basically wanted to take everything that the Jews had established through God, by God, and take it out of the church. They didn't want any more, ever, for it to be called Passover. Because it had a Jewish connotation with it. It was a... Uh, now, they weren't even saying it was the law of God. They were just changing all kinds of things. That's also when they changed the actual um, Sabbath day from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday to Sunday. Yeah. Because that's what the Jews were doing. Mm -hmm. That's what the Jews had been given to do by God. But in their infinite wisdom, as they call it, divine wisdom as they call it, they wanted to change all that and establish their own stuff. So yes and no, what you're saying is correct. But we've got to add the understanding of why they did it. Well, why did they do it? Well, they weren't following God. No. Simple as that. Following man. Because, well, probably Satan. Mm. Because the fact of the matter is, Satan wants to pull everything away that is godly. That is right. That is true. And, and that's where all that Easter started coming from, you know. But she said, well, wait a minute now. Easter's written in the King James Version Bible. It's not written in the manuscripts. It's written as Paschal, Passover. Now, it was translated, it was transcribed into the English Version. And probably even, I don't know if it was Germanic or not. Germanic. Mm -mm. I'd have to look, look that up again. I don't want to say it was, and it isn't. So, But... Um, what verse am I? 34? Um, yeah, yeah, 34. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. So you notice it's, it's different orders, different sects, S-E-C-T-S, of the temple. They're sending out like the fledglings. They're sending out the disciples, and they're sending out... Higher muckety ducks as it goes along, you know. And now the Pharisees uh, are gathered together. Now they're going to come up with something to try to trip Christ up. 35. Then one of them, which was a lawyer. Now this is basically meaning a scripture lawyer. Asked him a question. Here, tempting him. In other words, testing him and saying, is there anything wrong in testing God? Testing God? Yes. Yes, there is. Yes, there is. 
Is there anything wrong in testing our knowledge? No. no. See, you got to separate the two. There's nothing wrong in asking a question. God wants, if we don't understand, He wants us. He expects us. It's our reasonable service to ask a question. Yes, but is it t isn't testing Him like saying, well, God, if you love me, you'll do this. Exactly. There's a big difference, mm -hmm. say. One's testing and one's tempting. Okay. Master, here it is again. Teacher, verse 36. Which is the great commandment in the law? Question. 37. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Period. Okay. But he continues. 38. This is the first and great commandment. In other words, this is the most important commandment. 39. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Show me those ten commandments where it says that. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Mm -mm. So he's not quoting from the ten commandments. When he says here, this is the first and great commandment. Then he goes in verse 39, and the second, meaning the second other than the Ten Commandments that I gave you. See, remember Christ gave this, I'm going to give you another commandment. Remember when he told mm -hmm. his disciples? At the last oh, supper, wasn't it? Um, no, this is really, <coughs> I believe, could be wrong, I believe this is on the Mount of Transfiguration. Mm. Uh, right before Christ ascended, and he gave his disciples. But this is a precursor to that, because Christ is speaking it. See, Christ had spoken a lot of things. Remember it says another thing in the Word of God, where if, if everything Christ had was spoken was written down, that there wouldn't be enough volumes of books in the world to contain it. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things that Christ said that's not in the Bible. But what's in there is the gist of everything that he said. So right here is a gist. It's, it's basically, it's another commandment that he gave his disciples right at the end. And the second is like unto it. In other words, like unto the great commandment. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, both being of love. See, 40. On these two commandments... Hang all the law and the prophets. That's why they're so important. Because if you do these two, now think about this. If you love, you're following every commandment. Mm -hmm. You're following every commandment. You're not going to do something to somebody else you don't want done to you. You're not going to do bad things. You're not going to think bad things. You're not going to not love God. You're not going to not follow the Sabbath. You know, if you're loving God, and you're loving other people, how can you go wrong? But see, here lies the problem today. People don't know what love is. Mm -hmm. They just don't know what love is. Oh, they have forms of it. You know, like like having a child, raising a child, you learn, you love that child. Well, guess what your father's telling you? Your neighbor. You need to, you need to love that neighbor like you love your child. Is that easy to do? No. Absolutely not. But he's telling you, hey, you want you want to be in that realm with me? You you want to understand? You want to, to have all the blessings that can be bestowed upon you? Then you need to learn what this love means. You know. Now, did God hate? Yes. What do you hate? Um sin. Sin, yeah. It's the only thing I think of. Now he called he called these uh these uh, uh high muckety ducks here just a few moments ago hypocrites. Did that mean he didn't love them? Mm -hmm. Well, how can you love somebody today that's your enemy? Because you're supposed to love your enemy. You love the soul God created, but not what they're doing and partaking in. Exactly. Yeah. You don't love sin, but you love the creation. You really, you love the possibility 
that one can achieve, which is godly. Yeah. So, verse 41, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, verse 42, what think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, well, son of David, which was completely correct. Because, in other words, they studied the word, they studied the Torah, and they knew the Torah had proclaimed that the Christ would come through that lineage, the king line, which would, he would be called, Christ would be called the son of David. Remember, uh, uh, was it last week or week before last where, where the beggars are on the side of the road and they're calling for Christ, the, the blind guys. Mm -hmm. And they're calling for Christ and saying, he's son of David. See, so they knew. See. So he says, what think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? And they say unto him, the son of David. 43, he saith unto them, how can then doth David in spirit Call him Lord, saying, 44, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. And 45, he says, If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? Good question. They couldn't <coughs> understand that. They couldn't understand the lineage umbilical cord to umbilical cord to bring forth the Son of Man into flesh. So because they couldn't answer that and they didn't understand it, the final verse says, verse 46, and no man was able to answer him a word. Neither does any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. So basically, he took these high monkey duck preachers who thought that they knew all the answers and had all the questions answered. And Jesus got him to a point of asking him, asking them a question and they couldn't, they couldn't answer it. And they're supposed to know. They're supposed to be the teachers. But see, they got schooled, as we call it today. <laughs> they got schooled today. And does this mean that they didn't ask any more questions outside of the temple because they did question him when they brought him in for his trial. They were questioning him about the things that he said, yeah. but they never asked him any questions as far as wanting to learn anything. Oh, okay. See, they were trying to trip him up all, all do, through this whole mm -hmm. chapter here at this point. They were trying to trip him up. And when people would fail to trip him up, they would send other people. And at this point, this was, this was basically the, the, the straw that broke the camel's back. Is that they realized they couldn't trip him up. Now remember, as we covered a couple weeks ago, they knew who he was. They knew he was the Christ. Remember, we were given the parable by Jesus himself about uh, Jesus giving us that parable where, where he's sending, he had bought a vineyard and he hired servants, and they kept uh, killing the servants. Remember that? Mm -hmm. It's the same principle here. Now, and then at the end of the parable, it says, I'll send my own son. But they, they slew him, thinking that they could inherit. See, mm -hmm. it's the same principle here. So that, they knew who he was, but they just didn't believe. No, yeah. and they didn't want to have anything taken away from their temple, mm -hmm. not God's temple, their temple. <coughs> See, and they knew Jesus. If 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 Jesus was to continue, they knew that Jesus basically would take over everything, because after all, that's what he's going to do eventually. But they didn't want to give it up. They didn't want. They didn't want to be followers. They wanted to be followers. <coughs> It's the same principle today with a lot of a lot of preachers. You know, 
They say that they're following the Lord. They say that they're following Christ. and they, they say a lot of things behind the pulpit. But the fact of the matter is, is that when, when, when they're cornered with questions of, of in-depth truth, and you ask them, such as flyaway doctrine, those that are teaching flyaway doctrine, who do you think is going to walk out of that meeting understanding? The person asking the questions about why they're teaching falsely uh, flyaway doctrine. When you could lead them to the Word in Ezekiel 13.20, and it says, God is against those who teach His children to fly to save their soul. And you read it for themselves, you read it to them, they read it for themselves, and they'll still deny it. Then they'll come up with something, oh, well, that's the Old Testament, that's been changed, and in Christ, blah, blah, this, and blah, blah, that. You know, there's all kinds of different answers. Oh, yeah. Why won't they give up their teaching and understanding the way they understand it? Because they don't want to give up what they think that they have. Oh, if I teach that, then you know, I'll be, I'll be drummed out of this church. And then that's the best thing that could ever happen to them, mm -hmm. if that's the case. Now, I do know one in particular that did do that. Yes, he was drummed out of a church, but guess what? Went down the road and opened up another mm -hmm. one, and he's teaching the truth. I'm not saying they're not out there. We know that we have God's elect, God's remnant in this day and age. And they are teaching truth, but they're far and few between. There's less and less. And we know, we've read and studied the end of the book. We know that many are called, but few are chosen. And the reason they're not chosen is because they're not willing to do it God's way. All right, we're in here today. Are there any questions on what we cover today or anything else? All right, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy name. We thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity of this day. We thank you for the lessons that you have brought forward to us. I pray for everyone here today and their families and all those on YouTube who are watching or who will watch and their families that you lead, guide, and direct us all. And we will always give you glory, honor, and praise. For we love you with all our hearts, with all our minds, with all our strengths, and with all our souls. For it is in Yahshua's precious holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. To God be the glory.